Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 16 of Night Call. So, it's night 6, so we're close to the end. I think we know everyone now, except for her. So I'm just gonna go there. I know I kind of thought I said in the beginning that I wanted to concentrate on a few and then finish them, but... What the hell? That's not really a long distance, but okay. I don't know, just so we met. Your next passenger instantly makes you feel uncomfortable. Oh, how nice. She's small, but nonetheless exudes strength and dynamism. She says nothing and stares at you. You wait a moment. Where to? Shut up. What? You find the tone of her voice and her accent disconcerting. She clearly hates you. Did we cause another accident? I know who you are, and I'll be the one doing the talking. Oh, maybe that's why you ordered a taxi for around the block. You are a monster, a demon. Her voice cuts like a knife. A few days ago, you picked up a young girl, my daughter. Oh, is she Esmeralda's mother? Her voice is curt. And now she's disappeared. She ran away. Her voice is hurtful. So you and I are going to the Boulogne police station and you are going to explain to an officer how you helped a young girl run away. Hold on, let's talk about this. Because if it's Esmeralda we're talking about, I did nothing wrong. Tell it to the police, not to me. I have nothing to say to you. Your daughter, I stopped her from running away. Tell it to the police. Okay, I can tell them that. Listen. She stares at you. Hear me out. Where is my daughter? Look me straight in the eyes and tell me. Your daughter spoke about wanting to run away. She couldn't deal with your relationship with your ex-husband anymore. She gives you a deaf stare. Why did she talk to you about that? Everyone talks in a taxi. Actually, most people take taxis so they can talk. Deaf stare again. That's none of your business. Well, I didn't ask her, so... I didn't force her to tell me. She shakes her hand like she's impatient to get somewhere. She talked about running away? She had a rather half-baked plan in mind. She wanted to go north to live with a girlfriend in a town starting with L. I don't really remember her saying that. But okay. She closes her eyes, takes on a sour tone. She's in Lil. You lift your eyes. L for Lil. When I asked Lola if, I, if she knew anything, she lied. She looked me in the eyes and lied. Your passenger takes a deep breath. When is the last train for Lille? You look at the clock. In a few minutes. Full speed ahead then, go! You start the engine. If I find my daughter, I won't file a complaint, but if anything happens to her... Really? Why is everyone so out to pin any crimes on us. Come on, we're just a taxi driver. Just shut it, lady. She manages her anger. You speed towards Gare du Nord. At this hour, there's no one in the street. Your wheels spew arcs of rainwater to the sides. There's a series of unsynchronized red lights along the remainder of the boulevard. If you run them, you'll get to the station in time. Otherwise, you might miss the last train. Well, that's an interesting question now. Do we run the red lights or don't we? I guess it's concerning her daughter, so... After you run the third red light, your passenger breathes a small sigh of relief. She's clearly grateful for the effort. Yeah, so maybe don't report me for anything that I didn't commit. Everyone's crazy in this town. You can see Gare du Nord in the distance. You get there with enough time for your passenger to make the train easily. As she's getting out, she glances back at you. If I don't find my daughter, the police will hear, will hear all about you. Oh yeah, tell them I jumped some red lights too. If you're trying to pin your daughter's disappearance on me as well. 
Her voice cuts the night into tiny pieces. Oh, I should have stopped at the red light. You almost feel shaky. I don't know. How is this my fault? Small woman walks away without paying and vanishes into the station. She... What? Seriously, what's wrong with people? Committed crimes for her. Bitch. I wonder if RV tells us a new story now. It's just... I don't know. Would be interesting. Hey, pal, can you help me out? I don't know. You don't pay me. Oh, well, I remembered. He doesn't pay, so... It seems our, nights will, our night will be starting with no pay trips. Yeah, okay. So another zero euro trip and it's already been a conversation that we knew before so i'm gonna drive her again because let's see what she has to say now oh what's happening now you slow down the smell of cigarettes creeps in around you it turns into stale cigarette smell then the smell of a freshly stricken match you slowly raise your head to look in the rear of your mirror. He is there. Oh, it's us again. So, piece of shit. Happy to see me again? Uh, you weren't that helpful the last time we saw each other. He reveals a row of pearly whites. Too white. No worries, I won't be here long. It occurred to me. Since your wife left you, you haven't gotten laid, have you? That must be hard on morale, huh? And I mean, there were opportunities. There was Cynthia, that her name? The nurse who changed your bag of piss. He lets out a snicker. Or that chick you never called back. Hmm, what was her name again? Well, I don't know. He glances sideways at you. You know very well who I'm talking about. Go on. His voice gets quieter, sounds far away. Say her name. What's the name of that girl you never called back? Probably Julie, I don't know. Yes, say it louder. Julie. Exactly. He smiles. Julie. Julie. Pretty Julie. When was it? Five months back? Six maybe? Something like that. I don't know. It seems like it doesn't really work if we tell him that we don't know. Because apparently he knows, so we have to know too. Passenger. Smile. Numbers. Swapped in a taxi. A coffee. Her hair cut a bit too short. But you're into short hair, aren't you? You like it when they look like dudes, don't you? Hmm. Shut it. Say nothing. You lower your eyes. Bits and pieces of the coffee date start to resurface. So, why didn't you call her back? Julie, she left you messages. The last syllable hangs in the air. She wanted to see you again. Julie. The last syllable shimmers. She wanted to keep conversing with you. Julie. The last syllable burns. Oh well, why didn't we call her? Tell the truth. She scared me. He smacks his thigh. There it is. She scared you. Because she was... He is waiting for you to answer, but you can't get the words out. They're stuck on the tip of your tongue. Because that Julie, she was smarter than you. Because you knew she was gonna talk about shit you wouldn't understand. Because you're too stupid. His posture shifts. It's almost imperceptible, but it's like he is melting into the back seat. You're too stupid. You lose your temper. You turn around to scream at him. Just shut the fuck up already. He has vanished. You're alone in the cab. A truck passes you. 
The sounds of the city slowly come back to life, a metro in the distance, a party on the first floor of a nearby building. You turn the car on, but let your fingers linger on the keys, the metal is neither warm nor cold, just reassuring. You stay like that for a second before driving off. Well, she's still here, but she's pretty far away, so maybe I'm just gonna pick up him or her. And hopefully he or she pays. Kiara Yaman, I need help with the delivery. Oh, she pays good. She pays well. Huh, well then. Let's take her. The passenger who sinks into the backseat is one of the hordes of cyclists you almost always hit at red lights. She's a bike courier, the kind who pays no attention to red lights, stop signs, or right of ways. Oh, that's not nice. She gives you a smile. Holy shit, it's flipping freezing out. You smile. Do we know each other from somewhere? I don't think so. Hmm, probably just cut you off on my bike or something. Or maybe it was me, maybe I changed lanes without signaling. You both burst out laughing, she gives you an address. It's for a delivery, but it's too cold, I can't seem to get warm. You start the cap and turn the heat to high. Warm air fills the car, the young woman nods. Thanks, that is exactly what I'm here for. She closes her eyes as if to enjoy the muffled hum of the heater. I hope you don't mind, there was no way I was going to get back on my bike. I left it behind with my colleagues in front of that restaurant. She sighs. I know it's pretty counterproductive paying for a cab ride to deliver food, but I just... All the warm air, it feels good. How's work going? The young woman is struggling to stay awake. Pretty good, though I had a run-in with one of my colleagues tonight. He is... She falters. He's a real know-it-all. The kind of guy who thinks he's been there, done that. The work itself is pretty good, though. In the winter, we do a lot of business. People stay holed up at home like rabbits. I have to say, I understand them. She yawns. I'm warming up, but I sure am tired all of a sudden. She closes her eyes. Uh, sorry, we're already here. You pull up to the address. That was a fast ride. Right. Back to work. The delivery girl quickly exits the cab, slamming the door behind her. She rings the door of an elegant Parisian building. A moment later, the door cracks open. The courier hands her client a plastic bag with takeout containers inside. She smiles. The door shuts. She rushes over to the cab and flings herself into the back seat. Come on, let's get out of here. Fast. You start the cab. Back to the restaurant, please. I left my bike there. Well, that's that. Her phone chirps. Business is picking up. She sighs. But yeah, I think I'm going to wait a little. Check it later. She settles comfortably into the back seat and closes her eyes. Have you been doing this for a long time? It's been... Hmm, this is my second winter, so yeah. A year and a half or so. Time really flies. I have to say it gets pretty boring after a while. She flashes you a toothy grin. At first you're like, yeah, what's the best shortcut? How can I get to the restaurant as fast as possible? But after a while, you know, always the same old routine. There's a pause, she gives a short laugh. Nah, I shouldn't complain, really. At least I can take it easy on my bike. There's no one to really mess around with me. She lets out a silvery laugh. It's very soothing in tone, the laugh of someone you can trust. What did you do before? Marketing. 
startup company one of those super pretentious places where everyone speaks three languages and only eats whole grain and my boss was a total asshole who was always grabbing my ass a look of revulsion flickers across her face so now i'm done with all that she looks serious as if she had just concluded a long speech so that, my friend, is why I wouldn't trade in my bike for all the world. Any prospects for the future? No, you're right. Not much as far as prospects go. It's not like I'm going to be made team manager or anything, that's for sure. But it's not all that bad. There are worse jobs around. Silence. And I know what you're going to say, I'm being exploited, badly paid, all that, but the worst part is actually the customers. You look at her in surprise. No, I swear, it's true. You deliver their dinner because they're worn out after working all day? And they don't even tip you a single euro. Still, they're understanding and all that, they give me articles about all the big bad delivery businesses abusing us. And then they order sushi from the restaurant down the street. Never trust a stomach. She makes a little farting sound with her mouth. Believe me, a bunch of cheapskates. She stops you with a gesture before you can speak. But all that is just for the time being. Promise. I'm putting a little aside, like my father always said. I'm going to open a takoyaki food truck. Have you ever had takoyaki? You pull up to the restaurant, a swarm of bike couriers are waiting for their orders. Mmm, I think takoyaki is something Japanese, so... Probably, no, I think I never had them. It's a specialty from Osaka, octopus fritters, but not just any fritters, my grandmother's recipe. It's basically a pretty simple idea, sell them to people lined up for concerts, movies, plays. She smiles. Anyhow, I'm out of here. There are a lot of starving people in Paris and we don't want to let them down. She hands you the fare and exits the cab. Thanks again, really. Good company. If you ever need a shortcut, just ask. She gives you a last smile and walks over to her crew. That was an interesting talk. Who's he? I think I saw... Okay, I mean... I just want to drive her again. It just has to be. I'm sorry. Then I think I need a gas station. But... This will be the last night. For the last night, we have... We're pretty good on money, I'd say. Oh no. Victor Hugo's the infected hemorrhoid station. Oh great. She's still not over her traumatic Tourette syndrome. You immediately recognize the passenger who just sat in the back of your cab. Pricely perfume. Fur around her neck. And a strange form of emotional trauma that causes her to say terrible things. Oh, it's you again. You know... Urethral fart. I was thinking about the last time we met. Oh, did you? I don't know. I thought in the end you were cured. So how, what happened again? You listen to me. I don't often cross paths with people who listen to me and don't make fun. I really appreciated it. She flashes a sweet, charming smile. Leaky condom. She gently shrugs her shoulders. Drive towards the 16th arrondissement, please. She purses her lips and manages to stifle the insult ready to escape. Yeah, please. Come on. You start the car, praying that this time around your passenger won't say anything during the ride. Your passenger sighs. Do you know what I did today? You glance at her in the rear of your mirror. I don't know. Swear a lot? No idea. Well, dear sir, I opened a bank account. She flashes a smug smile. 
in my own name. Fucking bitch. Don't think that's your name. She takes a moment. He didn't have an account before? My husband never thought I needed one. He took care of everything. It was easier. She shrugs her shoulders like it was all of no importance. Double fuck. I get it, you know, how terribly complicated all of this paperwork is, all these contracts, page after page of tiny print. The woman at the bank was charming, very instructive, four-legged slut. Her face is clouded with sadness for a second. I could tell, of course, that all this... She points to her face. All this bothered her. Oh, really? I wouldn't understand why. Bitch can't slut. That's probably why they didn't want me to open my account in our old branch. She looks out at the road passing by. An awkward silence fills the cab. Your passenger puts an end to it, her voice lightly croaking as she speaks softly. Both my children had bank accounts before I did. Isn't that unbelievable? And my daughter? She told me a thousand times that it wasn't normal. Dick, that everyone should have a ass, that the 1940s were over. And I blew her off, you see. I was happy with the way things were. Her eyes grow hazy, her lips purse. How did it work? Well, pussy, my husband gave me cash. He took care of any major expenses himself. She shrugs and seems slightly annoyed by the question. I don't really know why, but I never felt the need to have my own bank card. Really? Not when we got married, nor after. Tiny dick. You get the impression that the last outburst wasn't quite like the others. It almost seemed intentional. <laughs> you know, I've never paid rent. Not a shadow of pity in her voice, simply an observation. I'm starting a completely shit fuck new life. I have to sign papers and send letters and documents proving I actually live where I say I do. It's odd. She heaves a strange sigh. I'm starting a new life, like I was on the run and hiding behind a false identity. Quite dramatic, isn't it? Hamster up your ass. She smiles crookedly, but it's so fast you almost miss it. You're not far from your destination, your passenger appears lost in her thoughts. The trip continues in silence for a few minutes. Bitch. Almost. Until you pull up in front of your client's place, she almost jumps when you speak up. Here we are. Yes. You know, diarrhea. My parents live just a little further up the street. She lets the sentence hang in the air like she's learning the fact at the same time as you. Actually, I lived my whole life here. She pays her fare to build her brand new, spranking clean. Good night and good luck, sir. Syphilis. And she gets out. You watch her until she disappears into the lobby of her building. Oh well. It's nice, almost nine, almost ten euros tip. That's nice. Hmm, so will I be able to do like the last ride? So I'm wondering, I mean, now that Alice or Alicia or something and him, they come up almost every time now. So I wonder if they, ju if they are able to give us clues. So I'm just gonna go there and see and then I think I need to oh okay then it's the night is over I hope I have enough gas for this trip next passenger immediately raises her hand drive I don't care where I just need you to drive okay so that's not how this works that's just shooing her away so let's just start driving you turn the key in the ignition yes they are good keep going this way her deep full voice makes you slightly uncomfortable. So is this another billabong story or...? With closed eyes, she seems like she's in a place far from the back seat of your taxi. When she starts speaking, there's an odd whistle in, whistle in her voice, like she has a hole in one of her teeth. 
Slow down. Frail or fragile? A bit surprised, you look back at her in the mirror. Answer me, frail or fragile? Uh, I'm not sure. Don't think about it, just say the first one that comes to mind. Frail or fragile? <laughs> Fraggle. <laughs> Let's just go with fragile. Ah, odd. I wouldn't have thought that of you. After all, frailty applies more to humans than to objects. The whistle in her voice crackles for a second. Both words actually have the same root. A smile spreads across her face. Two words, two units. And life went on and words mixed once again. She pauses. You okay? She doesn't hear your question because she starts to scream. What the hell? Go down the street and stop. You speed up in the quiet street. The cold weather has driven away all the passers-by. There, yes. Good. I've got it. She cries out with joy and it resonates in the cab. I've got it. Look, the words are right there. They're wandering past us like sheep, like... She explodes with laughter. What words? She immediately stops laughing. She silences you with a wave of her hand. Now, I must write. She closes her eyes, her fingers stroke imaginary upholstery. The frail are forced into battle. Together come the children, a son and a daughter, standing tall to salute. They will cry, oh yes, they will cry. The eaglets fly behind. The frail will say... Your passenger freezes. When she opens her eyes again, she stares at you. What happens when you sleep? She's waiting for your answer. I... sleep? I dream. She tilts her head to the side just a bit. No, that's a lie and you know it. Hey, that's not true. And what happens when you drive? I hopefully don't sleep. I work. Exactly. You give your time to others. She laughs strangely, almost a snicker as her eyelids droop. And the sun will say, Frail father, I want you to come back to life. And the daughter will say, Frail father, I want you to come back a winner. The whistle in her voice grates on your ears. The father responds, You must choose. As the eaglet lands upon his shoulder, together they fly off. And thus all began. Fragile, frail, two paths that can't be fooled. The son and daughter will grow up, though not at the same pace. When early one morning, twenty years later, they wake up. They wake to the, to the sound of a bugle. The sound will be beaten, and churned and clubbed until he wakes from a thousand-year dream. A dream without sails, in which the daughter and son fish al Sadin. May they learn to live again without their father. Frail and fragile. Frail is fragile. She catches her breath. Eleven years. I've been writing this poem for eleven years. Are you kidding? <laughs> Good job. You get the impression she didn't even hear you. For 11 years I've been trying to finish the text. It's filled with so much. It's infused with my entire life. Its lungs are swollen with my tears. Her breathing is now quite irregular. And it was all waiting right here in this street right in front of me. She giggles. Thank you. She sighs and places a few bills in front of you, far more than a fair. Stop here and... You pull the cab over. Keep everything. I have nothing more. What? She gets out of the taxi without a peep. Uh, wait, what? She walks away without responding to your call. 
It seems to you that it's only an impression, but it looks like she's getting smaller and smaller with each step. Darkness swallows her and you sit there a bit shaken by her poem. You pick up the money, something falls at your feet. You grab onto a small shiny white seashell with your fingers. You look at it for a second without saying a word. Eleven years. The idea makes its way into your brain. You take a minute and drive off. Thank you, lady. Ooh, I definitely need a gas station tomorrow. Kiara made me hungry. Uh, maybe because we talked about takoyaki and food. I don't know. Hmm. What I'm wondering now is... I guess we should receive the call from Brissé when we get home now. Alicia finished her poem, Fragile. So she finishes different poems, I guess, because this was a new one. We didn't know that. So, I guess Bruce is gonna give us a call now. You wipe your face, you're starting to feel sleepy. Did we get to know anything new? I don't believe we did. I'm gonna stay with my suspect Gilda. I think she did it. Who knows what Jesus tells her to do, so... Yeah, now Bussy is calling us. It's the moment of truth. Hello? Hi. Ice cold. So? She heaves alongside. There's no background noise. She must not be at the station. Yeah, I got a name for you. You won't answer anyway if I ask. Perfect, I'm listening. You glance at the wall. I don't have to remind you. You cannot get this wrong. Yeah, I know. Okay. I'm gonna go with Gilda. I mean, it is kind of interesting that it's always the first suspect, because in the last case it was the first position too, but... Let's accuse her. Okay. I'll buy it. Seems like a solid choice. I can fish around a bit to vet your information. I'll call you tonight. Try to get some sleep. She pauses. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, if we would have picked a, another... If we picked the wrong person, if she would have responded differently today. So, let's see what tomorrow will bring. A black shadow creeps out of your mouth and bangs loudly on the floor. This is so confusing because most of the time the lines that are down here are the same, but then now and then something creepy as this comes up. You wake with a start. Oh, I guess it was a dream, yeah. <laughs> you glance at the floor, there's nothing there. You lie back down, still shaking. Night seven. Oh. Who filled up our cab? You've barely gotten downstairs. Did she fill up our cab? That's nice. So let's see. Get in. Good news, you're right. Or at least the DA thinks your evidence is sufficient. No emotion in her voice. She's giving you the facts, nothing more. We're going to get that crazy lady tonight. She leans to one side, looks away for a minute. Let me guess, I have to drive her. We were so busy looking for connections that we didn't understand there weren't any. But tonight, tonight it'll all be over. In about an hour or two, we're going to get her to leave her place. And you will pick her up. What? She pulls some kind of pen out of her pocket that she puts in the little cubby just above the car stereo. Okay, yeah, we know that this is a bug. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, I held up my end of the deal. It's all the same, again. She 
You already talked to her. She knows you. Earn her trust. Don't try to be a hero. Just bring her to the meeting point and hand her over. She sighs. Two teens walk by the cab and the intense smell of weed fills the cab. Busey doesn't budge. I know you can do it. If you stick to the plan, nothing can go wrong. Well, I do suppose that there will be a problem, but... Mm. <sighs> it doesn't matter anyway. I'm off. Pick the suspect up, drive to the meeting point, and you're free. Easy as pie. So... Yeah, she's here again, so let's pick her up and find out more about her. Hmm. <laughs> I'm interested to see how the conversation with her goes. I mean, apparently we're not that great of a person when if we really killed our brother. Her again, fur around her neck. Yeah, we know, I know. And a strange form of emotional trauma. Yes, again. Oh, it's you again. You know, your evil fart. She says the same thing again? Suck your mother. She gently shrugs her shoulders. Drive towards the 16th around this mom, please. She purses her lips and manages to stifle. Okay. I hope it doesn't bother you too much. For a second you don't know what she's talking about, but then... Wench. Some days are harder than others. It must surprise people. Oh, it fuck does. It's more the teasing. You see... Cauliflower-shaped anus. She looks away for a second, disgusted by her own coarseness. Our neighbor's son... She shakes her head. It's a long story. They're expats... Chinese. She works for Chanel, I think, and he for a big import-export company. I can't remember its name. Transatlantic Sodomite. Something like that, anyway. She sighs. She's getting annoyed with herself. Her only son used to come get help with his French from my husband and me. Now that we're separated, Rugrat, he still comes around. But he films me. Oh, he's discreet about it, of course. He slips his phone into the front pocket of his blazer and films me. He must think it's funny. An old lady who swears and calls everyone. She stops, purses her lips. When she opens her mouth again, she's glassy-eyed. Maybe he even shares them with all of China. I guess she shares them with more than just China. The internet is for everyone. <laughs> Shit, yes, Rugrat. Her mind wanders for a second. We don't really have any idea what goes on over there. My daughter said I might have become a dick internet star there. That's really likely. You raise your eyes to look at your passenger. The last syllable hangs in the air, oddly accentuated. Uh, perhaps you're right. Honestly, I don't know. Is this really a thing that of emotional trauma of your husband's leaving or I don't know, your marriage breaking that you suddenly develop Tourette syndrome? Because if it is a thing, then I'm sorry, but I don't know if it really is. And at the moment, I just believe that she's making a scene and she should get a grip of herself. If it's a real condition, I wouldn't say that, but... I just think she's strange and acting up. So perhaps you're right. Her voice becomes screechy. You think? I don't know anything about any of that. It's beyond me. She raises her eyes abruptly to look at you because she can talk normally with us. If she wants to tell you something, she can. So I don't really believe that this is like she can't control it. And plus, death P. And plus, I'm not a good influence on this boy. He's learning swear words, that's no way to learn a language. Yeah, probably you shouldn't be the one teaching 
others French when you can't even control your own language. Especially not French. The language of love, the language of poetry, of ballads. She smiles a very sad smile at you. Dick cheese. Her smile vanishes. That, that's why I no longer see my grandchildren. My son thinks it's better we wait until it passes. I don't know, get some help, lady, come on. It's not that hard. I think he's right. She stares right into your eyes. I don't know, get diagnosed by a doctor or anything, but... Why is everyone suddenly so okay with that? She's just, oh, I suppose it must be trauma. And her children are like, yeah, okay, well then let's just wait until it's passed. So just don't visit our children in the time being, because we'll wait how it goes. I don't know if it's really trauma-induced, and maybe you should see a professional to cure that. You can tell she doesn't believe what she just said. It's not because of the divorce? Wait, no, it's... They don't support you? Uh, yes, of course. Jean Roland is a dear. Felches. But I don't want to bother him with this. He has his problems and I have mine. She lets out a little laugh, clearly designed to end the discussion. You're not far from your destination. In the back, your passenger is dousing herself with perfume. The smell is dizzying, overpowering, oppressive. Does this bother you? The perfume? It's quite strong. My apologies. She blushes briefly. I've been wearing this hairy ass perfume for 25 years. It's such a part of me, I don't even notice it anymore. It was the first present my husband gave me. Might be time for a change? Change my perfume? Underfucked. Why? He left you. I don't know, I really don't... Nah, let's just, let's just say something. Your remark hurt her, you can tell right away. She lowers her eyes. Oh, oops. What of it? He doesn't own this perfume. Yeah, I guess he's right. I guess she's right. It's mine. You pull up in front of her building. She hands you the fare, but doesn't move. Everything okay? Okay, I'm sorry I was so harsh to you. I don't know, I just can't take your condition seriously. Even when I told her that she should change her perfume because her husband left her, she didn't swear, so I don't know. She's just awkward. Yes, yes, it's just... I'm always anxious about going home so late. And no one is there. Cunt, cunt, cunt! No lights on? Every noise seems suspicious. Flabby vaginal queef. She pauses. Could you wait until I'm home before you leave? Her voice suddenly very deep has a tone that makes your hair stand on end. Sure. Thank you. Your passenger leaves the taxi and walks towards the lobby of her building. You watch her every move as she walks the dark meters between your taxi and the door. You chose not to mention that you do this for all your clients. Since the attack. Since you got hurt. Since you can't sleep like you used to anymore. She waves to you as the door closes. You have just enough time to get a glance off the white marble and shiny copper stairwell. The door slams. <sighs> oh well. It's a lot of money again. Okay, it's time to drive our crazy lady. Let's hope we don't die in the first possibility. So, in the first try. I have to get to Bastille, it's an emergency. Oh. Is Jesus in trouble? Park a few meters away from your next passenger. Your heart starts beating wildly, you glance at the bug hidden next to, your gear, to the gear shaft. The back door opens, creaks a little and slams, the young woman smiles at you. Good evening, sir. Her squeaky, high-pitched voice gives you the shivers, you start having doubts. Fiery slip of a girl, a killer? Yet, you think she is, and you have to be careful. Where to? Gagne Opera House, please. You nod and start driving. You feel a strange tingling sensation on the back of your neck. Don't kill me, lady, please. You glance in the rearview mirror, your passenger is staring intensely at you. 
Will she remember me now? When she starts speaking, her voice is filled with resentment. It's odd when you think about it. That call in the middle of the night. A problem at the opera. Something so serious everyone in the crew has to come. She looks outside. Her voice suddenly becomes more syrupy. I almost never see Paris this late at night. We prefer to work during the day, although for the scenery crew it makes no difference whether it's day or night out. But there's a sense. She pauses briefly, she's listening to the voice. Yes. She smiles, more of a smirk really, mechanical fake, your hands tighten around the steering wheel. Maybe that's the trick, keep her talking for as long as possible so she doesn't realize you're not quite going to Bastille. We can sense when the sun is set, when something is not quite right. You've been working there long? For a few years, yes. My father still works there. We build sets together. That must be fascinating. Incredibly, you can't last in this field if you're not passionate about it. We don't count our hours. Every detail is crucial. You remember Bissé's instructions. By yourself, time. By yourself, time. In some ways, I feel privileged. I... Who? What? She suddenly moves in an odd, jerking manner, her eyes bore into you. Busset? You feel your breath catch in your throat. She watches you. Who are you? Who is Busset? Something in the air shifts in a moment right before a knife appears in her hand. You've spent enough time investigating her to know it's the murder weapon. The scar on your thigh begins to burn. You start calculating the rest of the trip at lightning speed. You're not far now. If you manage to keep the discussion going, you might just make that alive. Answer me, who is Busset? What are you talking about? Jesus told me Busset is listening to us. Who is Busset? Who is Busset? You're shaking. Um, I don't know if we should keep this up any longer. She's a policewoman. The police? They know? The blade shines. There's something about the metal that hypnotizes you. You don't want to feel that pain again. For a second you consider throwing the car into a ditch. But you're not going fast enough. The impact would be minimal and your passenger is too close. Jesus. She looks lost, far away. You're buying time, second by second. Jesus said that I shouldn't be scared, that they'd never understand. Okay, wow, what do we answer to that? I was only asked to pick you up. They made me help them. They made you? You nod your head, shaking all the while. Oh no, I didn't mean to put you into such a state. Her voice grows deeper, darker, more muffled. There's no reason to be scared, you know. If I kill you, it will be painless. Jesus? Jesus tells me where to strike and who to strike. No one ever suffers. He promised me. The scar on your thigh says differently. He was in a coma because he was stabbed in the thigh? How is that? I don't know, that seems a little bit much, but okay. Jesus will put you in jail. And yet I felt pain. Let's just say that. I just want to know. <laughs> Pain. She recoils. You, you heard a guy I saw the night. Jesus killed that actress. Saw? I had to defend myself. I panicked. Jesus, Jesus was so angry with me. Wait. She lifts her head and listens to her imaginary friend. You calculate the remaining trip time. You'll be there soon. Soon, yes. Do, do they know about Jesus? Yes. In a matter of seconds, she loses her composure. Oh no, please don't kill me. I was- I felt that I was so close. They can't know, there's no way, he swore. Ouch! She leans forward abruptly, her voice changes again, becomes harsher. She starts talking to Jesus. Stop shouting, I can't even hear what I'm saying. Give me one second. No, I don't want to listen to you, I want- She turns to you and the words pour out of her. Sometimes he, you know, sometimes he asks me to do things I don't really get. At first I found it weird that Jesus hates people so much, then I found out just how horrible people really are. 
monster is just a few more meters. So I followed the orders he gave me. He told me exactly what to do, step by step. He told me to get the key out of the mailbox. There, there was a key in the mailbox. He told me where to hide in the shadows and which door hadn't been properly closed. He told me which tendon on the ankle to cut so they couldn't run away, where to slice so the blood would run and not spatter. Oh my god. You made it. Her voice resonates in your ears. He even told me what I needed to leave behind so the police would never find me. Cigarettes? Hair? Every night I felt peaceful. Incredible. What a wonderful feeling. It's so great to feel useful. When I went to bed that night, I felt so incredibly peaceful. So of course I agreed to follow him. Jesus, yes, Jesus. I followed Jesus and I... At that very moment, you turn onto the street where the cops are waiting. Oh, we did it. Headlights come on. The harsh lights flood the facade of an old black church. Your passenger yelps in surprise from the back seat. You hear the knife fall to the floor somewhere between the seats. You break hard. The back door opens, letting a rush of icy cold air into the cab. You turn around and see your passenger. She's running. Climbing up the steps of the church, you hear her calling for help. Suddenly she trips and falls, flopping awkwardly like a ragdoll. It takes a second for you to hear the cop's gunshots, to see the blood and to understand she's dead. Wow, they shot her? Nicely done for what it's worth. The sound of Bichet's voice kind of makes you want to grind your teeth. That chick was so far off our radar, we never would have suspected her. How was she a suspect then? She's been in your taxi for several minutes now, but these are her, free but these are her first words. I'm going to lie, this ended up much better than expected. Much, much better. You keep yourself from looking outside towards the church. Good investigation work. I had no choice. Yeah, excuse me for not getting all teary-eyed. I forgot my hanky at the station. Listen, we have your statement. We have your number. We have the recording. I don't think we need you anymore. If you could just lay low for a few days, let things settle a bit. She waves her hand around and seems irritated. There's bound to be some nitwit on a squad who'll blabber about how you helped us. Journalists might want to ask some questions. Not a word to anyone, you hear me? I feel her disapproving gaze on you. She knows you saw a cop take the knife out of your car. She knows you saw that same cop slide the knife into the killer's hand. She knows you saw the forensic team photograph the body after that happened. Oh wow, they're, they're staging it as she was attacking. She could have gotten help, yeah. No, she wouldn't have gotten help. She wouldn't have been judged mentally unfit to sit trial, put into an institution, and never really been punished. What about now? When will she be judged? Who the fuck cares? She's dead. We have her confession. We canvassed her apartment and among the hundreds of Jesus statuettes and various items stolen from her victims, we found enough proof to close the case. She stops annoyed and her face relaxes. I just saved the French Justice Department half a million euros. Hey, you're welcome. Right now, it'd be best if you went the hell away, okay? You're not overjoyed not to have to see her face anymore. A second later, Bisset is in the street walking toward her colleagues with what seems like a skip in her step. Your head hurts like something pounding on your temples or someone. Start your cab and leave the street. Look at the church. You can see Gilda's body under a blanket. They're still photographing the scene. Flashes flood the step. steps. The church disappears quickly, as does the street in Paris. Ooh, okay. I did it without dying. Proud of that. I gotta say I like this case a lot more. I just wonder if there could have been a, an, another outcome. Like if... You either die, or if Gilda gets to the church and then gets shot, or if... Like in the first case, if there would have been the opportunity to drive him where he wants to drive, or if this was just the way it was meant to be. But it was pretty shocking that, um, that Gilda was shot in the end, because it really seemed like she was just 
that heard voices that told her to do stuff and she would have been declared insane and probably put into an institution so uh, it was kind of a surprise that she got shot by the cops and then was staged as she was attacking them and if they and as they acted out of self-defense when it was just they didn't care they didn't care to bring her in alive so that was a shocking reveal to the story and um, I like that So can we call Christoph now? So yeah, I think that Adi was your that Adi is your sister-in-law and that the guy we're talking to is the brother. So I would really like to know why we killed him though. I, I wonder if this if this comes up in the third chapter. I don't know, your kids are good. Although I don't know, I think it doesn't really matter what we say right now. It doesn't really flow into the Pasadex as far as I know so I don't know what disappear means I'll just get back in the car so and that was it that was the angel of death and so I think I already pointed out in the beginning that I'm a little bit confused by how they designed the whole different chapters because it's basically the same story over and over again just with a different killer. I like the investigation thing and I enjoy the, the different people but I don't really get why it has to be that you get the same conversations over and over again until you can process progress them so and I gave it a little bit more thought which solution I would have enjoyed more so as I said it would have been strange if in the second case they tried to pin it on them on him again or something but it wouldn't be that far-fetched that the police come to him again if, if a few months later another murder happened and they desperately need the help of a good informant so that they approach him again maybe with a nicer agent or whatever and just ask him for his help where he can't refuse or I don't know they offer money or whatever that wouldn't that would make sense if if it's agreed then and it would have been nice if you can just continue with what you already know about your passengers and all that concerning the passengers that have a i don't know finished story like when in the first chapter we shoot away Kruki and then had to tell francine that he ran away sad that it happened that it went this way because i didn't intend to but on the other hand i mean if you have like the three chapters and then Kruki didn't appear like in a second chapter like it did because it was a new start it wouldn't have been a problem because if you wanted to change it you would have to start a new game but so like your decisions would have been more definitive like when we made up a lie with Ka with Carlo in the first um, chapter 
and I don't know if we were supposed to see him again after that, so, but that this would have transferred to chapter two and three, like it was connected in a bit, so it would have made sense as well. So like if you want to like redo, for example, the Carlo arc or the Kruki arc, you would have to start a new game like from the beginning, from chapter one. I guess that would have been like a solution that I would have enjoyed more. Talking to Evie again, he was a he was a suspect for the second time now in the second chapter, but you still didn't get a different uh, conversations with him now because when I picked him up, it was the first conversation from the first chapter again. So the fact that with every chapter you get sent back to zero or to start, it lessens the motivation to keep going a little bit or like not to keep going but to get into another chapter again because the first day it is kind of boring when the conversation is completely the same except for the murder weapon to change so it does take a little bit of time to like build this up again and also to like find the people that you haven't met yet or if you don't have the opportunity to pick up someone new that you have to skip through the whole conversation from someone that you already know once more um and that lessens like the the whole fun of the game a little bit but still there are a lot of people that we that we didn't meet so far and i would like to know more of the, i would like to i would like to get to know them all so I'm, I guess I'm gonna give the third chapter a try too. I mean now I'm just gonna skip everything that we already know, which in the first day will be a lot. I will do the third chapter because I mean now we have two thirds of the game, so why not do the third third as well? And we'll try to pick up the, the missing people and... Hey, okay, so I just found out that Perva, so the one that we drove to the, to the airport, there was nothing more to find out with her. That's too bad. I would have loved it if we um, at one point picked her and her husband-to-be up and drove them somewhere. That would have been nice. Would have been fun. So Esmeralda, she's the one that ran away, right? Yes, and Ariana. It's kind of sad that you don't find out what happens to them. And that it doesn't say here that if she ran away or not. I don't know. Anyway, that was chapter two. And the next time... I guess we're gonna start a new chapter. The last chapter. And find out what that's all about so thank you so much for watching thank you for sticking with me and i will see you next time